Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm very excited to welcome Vinicius Rosa Cotta this morning or morning our time. Um, he, we were happy to invite him to restart our webinar series after his engagement with our Neurotechnologies Symposium last November. I'm looking quickly, pulling up the bio, here we go. So Dr. Cota is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering of the Federal University of Sao Joao del Rey in Brazil. And there he researches neuroengineering as a means to treat epilepsy and comorbidities. Dr. Cota is the founder and leader of the Laboratory of Neuroengineering and Neuroscience at his institution. He's also a member of the Brazilian Society for Biomedical Engineering and a member of the Committee of Research and Development of Open Science Brazil. Dr. Kata is on the editorial board at the Journal of Open Hardware and guest associate editor for Frontiers in Neuroscience Neuroprosthetics section. He has recently been awarded a Marie Curie grant for an individual fellowship at the Italian Institute of Technology with Dr. Michaela Capoloni from the University of Genova to investigate neuroprostheses for brain injury patients. And today's talk is entitled Non-Periodic Electrical Stimulation as a Neuroprosthesis to Treat Refractory Epilepsy. And Dr. Kata, welcome. The audience is yours. Okay, thanks a lot, Alexis. So um, before I begin, I would like to express my big thank you to Alexis and Rio for this very nice invitation. Uh, we've been doing this research for a few years now, and actually we're very excited about it. We really believe that, that it can benefit the patient and it can benefit the neurotech industry. So to be here, to be able to convey this information, to disseminate these ideas uh, across uh, the, the, the very qualified audience of NeuroNexus webinar series is actually a privilege. So Alexis and Rio, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I really appreciate it. So uh, without further ado, I would like to put some context uh, into this presentation and briefly mention epilepsy. Um, epilepsy is a chronic neurological disorder, which is uh, characterized by spontaneous and recurrent episodes of aberrant and synchronous activity. And the expression of this aberrant synchronous activity are the seizures, not only motor seizures, but many other forms of seizures. And the neuro, neuro, neurobiological hallmarks of epilepsy are certainly hyperexcitability and hypersynchronism of neurotissues, neurocircuits, and cells, and so on. Uh, the thing is, epilepsy is an important disease in terms in regards to um, uh, public health. Uh, it's a disease that's a disorder of great prevalence worldwide. Uh, 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 approximately 1% to 2% of the worldwide population is affected with epilepsy. And seizures, they lead to loss of motor control, loss of consciousness, which can lead to material damage, injury, and also the, even uh, death risk. So uh, naturally, this jeopardizes physical activity. There are professional restrictions. There are a, a, a considerable impairment of daily activities, for instance, driving. Uh, and all this together brings a lot of stigma and prejudice towards uh, epilepsy patients. Of course, this is related to a large impairment in the quality of life of these patients. Uh, and also a very concerning is the fact that circa 30% of the patients, they do not obtain full control of the seizures while using anti-epileptic drugs. And also half of these patients is not eligible to surgery. So this is to make the scenario very bad for some, some uh, considerable portion of epilepsy patients. And I bring you here this quick, uh, uh, quickly this, this art uh, to just to represent, to illustrate that this disease has been associated with a lot of stigma and prejudice some cultures, and still today, inside of our cultures, modern cultures, it's sometimes considered a possession, a demoniac disease, and sort of a thing, um, things of the sort. So we have to take care of this important uh, disease. Anyway, of course, there is an alternative uh, with a therapeutic neurostimulation, and you probably are a little bit aware of all these techniques. We have, for instance, vagus nerve stimulation, target naturally at the vagus nerve or another option a, le a little less invasive regarding the cardiovascular function, which is the trigeminal nerve stimulation. We have deep brain stimulation for uh, epilepsy and also probably the state of the art in terms of uh, deep brain stimulation for epilepsy, which would be responsive neural stimulation, which is a closed loop uh, system. And um, 
of course, there are different, these, these technologies are in different stages of development. Some are already approved by FDA and other, regular, um, other regular, uh, regulatory agencies across the world, in Brazil including. But uh, uh, anyway, um, our group and our collaborators, we felt that uh, all these technologies, they were somehow neglecting one important aspect of uh, epilepsy, which is the hypersynchronism in epileptic phenomena. So we wanted to make a contribution in that direction. And actually, we got some inspiration in some uh, fundamental neurobiological facts, mm -hmm. uh, such as connectivity, beginning with connectivity. Well, with modern techniques, we can now understand better how uh, different brain areas connect uh, themselves. The, the and actually, when you see these results, uh, it's possible for us to think, well, uh, it seems that everything connects to everything else. But the thing is, um, we, are, we now also understand that these connections, they are dynamic, they change over time and uh, forming, uh, and, and there are a myriad of uh, neurobiological mechanisms to form uh, dynamic networks. And actually, neurofunction, they arise from these connections, this entrainment on nodes in the network of the brain. And in the past, we believed that neural function would be the activation of this or that area, but nowadays we understand that it's a rational network. Uh, I, I like to bring this, this, this important um, uh, uh, example here, which is the formation of memory traces across the sleep-wake cycle. It, this has been studied a lot uh, uh, by several groups, including the, the group of Born and Wilhelm. Klinz is also in this group of Born. And they have been finding this very interesting coupling of synchronization process uh, of different brain areas in different frequencies. For instance, neocortical slow oscillations, they synchronize with uh, thalamocortical spindles, which synchronize by, by their turn with uh, hippocampal ripples. And this is very important for consolidation of memory traces across the sleep wake cycle. So we know that these networks, they are entrained and they are put together by means of uh, synchronization, brain synchronization, right? But anyway, this is a, this is a reasonably well-known, well-established. And we also understand that if there is a disturbance in connectivity or in these networks, this will lead to aberrant levels of synchronization. Uh, it can be upregulated or downregulated, and by its turn, it will lead to neural dysfunction. And particularly, epilepsy can be understood as a neural dysfunction of synchronism, particularly hypersynchronism. Epilepsy uh, is, a, uh, is a hypersynchronization process um, that leads to seizures and all the other symptoms. So with this in mind, a few years ago, uh, um, together with the collaborators in Belo Horizonte at the Federal University of Belo Horizonte, we came up with this idea of developing a, uh, um, a form of uh, electrical stimulation that would uh, specifically uh, uh, um, target this hypersynchronization process of epilepsy. Uh, we termed it, we called it NPS for non-periodic stimulation, which is actually a low energy, temporally unstructured electrical stimulation uh, pattern. If you see here, you can see the, um, uh, how, how it presents itself across time. So you cannot see the regularity of pulses. The, the pulsatile forms of stimulation, they are usually delivered in very regular uh, uh, um, intervals between pulses. It's a fixed frequency. In our case, it is not. We actually, we randomize the, inter, uh, the, the intervals between the pulses, and then we get actually a distribution of these this, this values of IPIs, interpose intervals, okay? And this, it has this specific shape. It's important, this specific shape. I'll come back to this later. So, and then we devised and test this. And also it's important to see that it's low energy. We have only four pulses per second, uh, which is a, a obviously very quite important for neuromodulation techniques to, to deploy the, uh, um, the minimal amount of energy possible to the brain tissue. Anyway, uh, we got a patent for this. Uh, we actually deposited it in 2006 and only in 2019, we got the definite uh, 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 granting of the, the patent. Uh, in Brazil, it takes a long time, unfortunately. But, and here with this goes a little note of disclaimer because we own the patent for NPS. So we set out to test it. And this is, this is what our data looks like uh, usually. There are variations naturally, but what we do is a controlled infusion of this drug, it's ETC, it's a proconvulsant drug because it's an, an antagonist of GABAergic function. So uh, we infuse it intravenously in a controlled fashion 
and we record uh, the animal both by using local field potentials and also video. So we can correlate behavior to neural activity, electro activity. And the thing is, when we do this controlled infusion with PTZ, the animal displays a sequence of convulsive behaviors, uh, uh, starting with, for instance, uh, myoclonic jerks, then it follows by the four limb clonus, and then generalized tonic clonic seizures. So we can understand uh, the, the, the effects of our approach in different instances of time in different neural circuits because this, the seizures, this, this, these different stages of seizures are correlated with different neural circuits in the brain. And this, uh, this gives us a, a good insight of what our uh, approach is doing. So we apply this technique a lot. In the first publication of ours in the year of 2009, we could observe that NPS suppresses acute seizures induced um, uh, by PTZ. So we applied controlled diffusion of PTZ intravenously. Then we measured uh, the latencies uh, to convulsive behavior. Uh, with these measurements, we could, were able to calculate the drug, drug threshold. It, it, it roughly translates to the amount of drug necessary to elicit such, such behaviors, okay? And we apply four different patterns of electrostimulation. The periodic one with regular uh, interval, uh, um, uh, with the same uh, interpulse intervals across all the stimulation. And you see the histogram, everything is 250 milliseconds. We also applied a burst uh, a pattern of stimulation. So it's, there's a silence, a long period of silence, and then four pulses uh, grouped in the, the, the end of the, of the second. Uh, and then two different ways of um, randomizing the, uh, 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 the, the, the interpulse intervals that you can see in these last four panels here, okay? But what we call today, actually, NPS is just this last one with this shape, where again, which is important, I'll uh, come back to that later. So when we apply this in us, we have controls naturally, and we apply this to the right amygdala, and we chose the amygdala because of its importance in epileptic phenomena. And when we apply that, what we found is that um, when, while um, the, the periodic stimulation actually decreases the amount of drug necessary to elicit the convulsive behavior, uh, NPS, yeah, this, this last one, would uh, delay the, the seizures uh, for both for limb clonus and most uh, uh, pronouncedly generalized tonic clonic seizures. So meaning that um, uh, a, a greater amount of drug is needed to induce these behaviors when the animals is uh, undergoing uh, NPS, uh, temporal pattern of stimulation. And so uh, we understood naturally that NPS is anticonvulsant. We also test um, these to a very interesting model of epileptogenesis, meaning that we developed the, the epileptic condition in the animal. To do this, we take pilocarpine, which is a potent uh, cholinergic agonist, and we give a bolus injection uh, uh, to the animal, and the animal seizes uh, severely. Uh, for uh, if, if you don't treat the animal, uh, the animal will die, and we, we keep the animal seizing for a certain 90 minutes, and then we treat the animals, we get him out of the seizure, and uh, we treat him really well because it's really impactful, and uh, sometime later, circa 40 to 50 days, this animal will display spontaneous seizures. So this is actually a, a, a model of chronic seizures of epilepsy. And when we applied NPS to these animals, we could observe a decrease in the number of seizures and the durations of seizures with a tendency to decrease also the severity of seizures. So this is, uh, we understand this as a very important result because here we have dysfunctional tissue. This is a, a, as a, as a tissue in disease, neuro tissue in disease. And whatever the mechanism of NPS is, it is preserved in this functional tissue, which makes these more, this research more translatable. Anyway, you also perfected the, the, um, the stimulation pattern. We tried monophasic, and biphasic uh, uh, um, morphology of pulses, unilateral, bilateral, one side, the other side, and also in a synchronous form or a synchronous form considering both hemispheres. And what we found is that when you go from left to right in this panel here, we increase the anticonvulsant pattern of this NPS stimulation. So it's, 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 it's most uh, anticonvulsive when applied bilaterally, biphasic, and asynchronous. Okay, so we're able to increase the power, the anticonvulsive power, uh, anticonvulsive power of our stimulation. So just to sum up what we've seen so far, uh, NPS has anticonvulsant effects against acute seizures induced by PTZ. Also, spontaneous seizures generated by dysfunctional susceptible tissue in the PILO model. 
And also we have some evidence that which I have not shown here for an anti epileptogenic effect. It suppresses the generation of the epileptic condition. And also it's most efficacious when applied bilaterally and asynchronously. So uh, we then we set out to better understand the mechanisms. Um, yeah, we had an idea that this would suppress hypersynchronization, but we wanted to be um, uh, to get more insight into that. So we set out to understand the circuits doing uh, in some imaging experiments and some, so some electrophysiology experiments. Uh, in a collaboration, a close collaboration with uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais group, the Nucleo de Lier Sciences, this is our major partner in this research. We submitted animals to um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, a seven Tesla horizontal small bore scanner, and to understand, to better understand how uh, the, the brain is activated when submitted to PTZ seizures and also when submitted to our uh, stimulation patterns. So here in this first case, there is no stimulation, but the animals are submitted to PTZ, and you can see a widespread activation of for many for brain um, many brain areas, including the, the um, uh, limbic system axis in both sides. So okay, this is standard. This is uh, reasonably well known. Uh, then we applied uh, both the periodic stimulation part and also the non-periodic stimulation partner to compare. Uh, um, what these two, two, two different, very different ways of stimulating the brain would cause uh, in our animals. Anyway, what we saw, and important, this was applied to the right amygdala, and what we saw is when we apply the periodic stimulation, there is an increase in the signal, EMG signaling, in the same side of um, where our electrode is, in, in, including the basolateral amygdala. While when we uh, applied non-periodic stimulation, we see the opposite, a little bit of a decrease in the size where the, the, the stimulation electrode is positioned. So this is the first evidence of a synchronization, the synchronization process undergoing both ictogenesis and also um, our stimulation patterns. Uh, but we wanted to better understand the hypothesis of the synchronization. So we set out to do some electrophysiology uh, we recorded electrocorticograms and local feed potentials from the hippocampus and the thalamus, and we developed uh, this eye spike detection uh, algorithm. We first uh, bent past this, this uh, bent past filter the signals from 10 to 100 hertz, so we have the, the spikes really well highlighted and differentiated from the background activity. Then we do a spike detection, and then we uh, uh, analyze, uh, analyze the, the coincidence between these spikes across areas that we have been collecting data from. So, um, and also we do this uh, by using several uh, different uh, size of windows, analysis windows. For instance, this is the same pair of uh, spikes, uh, but here you have a very narrow window of just one millisecond. So you consider that there's no coincidence between these two spikes, but here you have, if you use a 50 milliseconds window, then you have a coincidence. And of course, we compared control animals with stimulated animals. So what we saw is actually that um, uh, the levels of ictal coincidence, uh, coincidence rate uh, across groups, stimulated groups are different from those uh, control groups. So these are several groups that we've been uh, performing under the, the, the PhD studies of Chassiara here uh, with the help of Sophia. Um, I will not go into detail of all these groups, but the, the red colors are actually, the red and orange colors are actually control animals, and uh, the, the green and blue shades uh, are um, uh, uh, stimulated animals. And so we see this uh, difference here, but we also see it when we take all these time points, or not time points, but the size of windows, and we decompose it in the groups, and we see many differences. Uh, from uh, stimulated groups from control animals. Uh, this, is, this is happening during four limb clonics when you see cortex versus hippocampus. And we also see during the clonic phase of the generalized tonic clonic seizure where the spikes are evident. And we also see a difference from, uh, in, in both pairs, uh, cortex and thalamus, and also hippocampus and thalamus. We went a little bit further to understand uh, some uh, the synchronization process using an analysis of cross-frequency coupling, particularly uh, phase amplitude coupling. Uh, a very good, way, very good way to measure this is by using modulation index. I'm not sure if you are familiarized with it, but 
it's, it's very simple, it's no big deal. What you do, you take a signal and you band pass filter it in two uh, band, different bands as, uh, as low frequency one, such as theta band, and, and, and a higher frequency one, such as low gamma. And from the low frequency, you extract the phase of the oscillation. And from the high frequency, you extract the amplitude. Then you're able to construct this, this, this histogram in which you see the amplitude for each phase uh, um, of your signal. And then there are, there are several different methodologies to detect if there are spikes. Because if there's a spike in this histogram, you can understand that this is uh, there's a, a modulation, there's a phase amplitude modulation between that, that phase and a certain amplitude. So uh, we did this with our animals and um, right before at the beginning of, uh, of the radical activity, epileptopian activity in our recordings, in what we found was uh, a widespread uh, synchronization process in many different pairs, across many different pairs of uh, frequencies here, uh, low frequencies and high frequencies. So um, anyway, uh, again, just reviewing the conclusions, what we found by this mechanistic investigation is that it corroborates the desynchronization effect that we were expecting, and also uh, suggests important additional role for microsecunds. I have not shown these results, but it's also a finding that we have a published finding of ours. Um, so uh, to, 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 um, to make this research of ours a little bit more translatable, because of course you want to, to get this uh, to, to the clinic, to, to the medical project scenario. Uh, we did sort of a preclinical trial, uh, trying to understand the impact of NPS uh, for uh, in neural function, in baseline um, basal neural function. We do know that amygdala uh, has, uh, with, with its um, uh, widespread connectivity to many other brain areas, they support uh, 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 crucial functions such as learning and memory with the hippocampus, uh, uh, with the striatum integrated motor response, broad good direct behavior, with uh, bad nucleus of histria terminalis, uh, generalized anxiety, aggression, motivation of the basal forebrain. So it's enrolled in many different neural functions important for the animal. So actually what this uh, undergrad uh, student of mine, Larissa, she was a brilliant psychology student, she did was to uh, submit animals to different um, uh, uh, tasks, to different tasks such as the elevated plus maze, the open field, we were seeking to understand a base level anxiety, also motor activity, a little bit of motor activity, also social interaction. There's no picture here, but we, we inserted the second animal into the open field. And also we uh, performed um, object exploration and recognition, as you see here, she put some objects in his arena. He, he naturally goes and he wants to explore it. So you do this one day and the second day you substitute two of these uh, uh, objects with two, two new ones. Uh, the animal, if the animal has um, uh, successfully acquired that memory trace, he will explore the novel objects and will neglect the, um, the familiar objects. So what she saw by uh, even when applying the lateral asynchronous NPS to the right uh, basal lateral amygdala is that both in the open field, um, uh, there's, there's no substantial differences across many of the parameters that we assess with the open field, both in the, the, the motor and baseline uh, anxiety studies and also in the social interaction studies. Um, there's also, we saw no big diffs. Okay, there's uh, uh, some difference here and there, but we do not consider this to be very significant. And uh, if you want details, please check our, <laughs> our publications. But we also saw uh, no difference when um, uh, evaluating the parameters of the elevated plus maze. And also animals of all groups, controls, sham operated animals and NPS uh, stimulated animals. Uh, they uh, successfully explore the novel objects, which is this white group here, uh, considerably more than the familiar objects in the recognition day. But we went a little bit further to understand this, this, the impact of NPS in the electrophysiological content of these animals. So we submitted these animals to uh, electro quadrogram and local field potential recording, and also uh, some electromyography so we could better uh, understand um, and, and detect distinct sleep-wake um, stages of the sleep-wake cycle. 
these animals were uh, um, we recorded from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and during eight consecutive days. In odd days, we did not apply NPS, and in, in even days, we applied NPS for the full six-hour extent of the recording period. We submitted these recordings uh, to two different sets of analysis. The first one was a, a, a visual inspection of the tracings for uh, sleep wake cycle staging. With this information, we were able to to compute time spent in each stage, proportions, transitions between stages, and we also perform some spectral analysis. And we also used this very interesting uh, methodology. I like it a lot. This was being devised by Giovazzoni and colleagues in 2004, in which we create a state map uh, out of spectral content of these um, uh, of the, the, the raw tracings. I will not go into details. But the thing is, at the end, you get some clusters of points in which you can directly relate to different to the different uh, sleep-wake cycle stages, such as REM, quiet wake, active wake, slow wave sleep, and so on. So you can you can very quickly understand the dynamic, the, neuro, the global four band dynamics, the transitions. Uh, if you see this, uh, uh, the perturbations in this um, uh, sleep-wake cycle architecture. So what we found was actually nothing, <laughs> hopefully. And the, the, the proportion of stages uh, was not different across all days of experimentations. The same goes for the transitions between stages, for the spectral content, for although it changes during, uh, of course, it changes uh, in, in each different um, stage of the sleep-wake cycle, wakefulness to sleep-wake, uh, sorry, slow-wake sleep and REM sleep but it does not change uh, spectral content, including the peak frequency in major rhythms regarding these sleep-wake stages. Also, uh, the, the state map is preserved across all days. It's um, essentially the same. If you, in, if you, for instance, uh, measure the area of these clusters, it does not change significantly. And the center of mass of all these points also does not change. So, in conclusion, uh, we saw that NPS has no significant impact on neural functions and global for brain neurodynamics, which led us uh, to understand, um, better understand, to have a better grasp of NPS. But anyhow, there was still some, some doubts regarding our approach, and we want to approach that. We, we want to better understand that, and we are thinking about it. So how to reconcile a couple of things. First, if NPS is indeed desynchronizing, why don't we see changes in spectral content, in neurodynamics, in neurofunctions uh, in these animals, in, in naive animals? Uh, why don't we see any changes in the spectral, um, in neurodynamics, and everything else? So we, are, we, are, we were a little bit puzzled about that. Also, uh, ictogenesis and its suppression is not, literature has shown that, that ictogenesis and its suppression is not as simple as a synchronization slash desynchronization, uh, simple duality. It's, there's much more involved. Actually, when we performed some cross-frequency coupling uh, analysis, we actually seen uh, that NPS induced, uh, induced synchronization in a few pairs of frequency bands. And it was not shown here, but we also saw that. And also, why does only one specific form of randomization work? If you remember one of my first slides, there were four patterns and two randomization uh, patterns, and only one. Uh, worked out. So why that happened? And right now we still have uh, these doubts, but at least uh, we have some clue and where to pursue these answers. And the thing is, we came back to revisit and better understand the temporal structure of our uh, simulation pattern. And it is, this has been known since the first paper, but we kind of neglected it. Uh, the thing is that the, the interpulse interval distribution can actually be fit very well. You see here a, a very high coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient. It can be fit by what is known as a power law uh, in, this, in this form, y equals one over f to the beta power with beta equals one of unitary exponent then. The thing is, uh, this kind of law, this power law, this, this mathematical relationship is, is known as power law. It's a scale-free pattern, and it closely relates to natural-like input and also to natural like neuronal activity. And we then we visit the, the literature and we found this very interesting couple of papers here from Gaul and Maroon 2003 and also Scarzi et al 2017. 
and they have been reporting high fidelity responses in Segal neurons when they are submitted to this kind of stimulation this, that, that follows a distribution of forces uh, with a power law. So uh, this, this gave us an inspiration to pursue a, 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 a subtle, uh, um, distinct form of desynchronization. That actually, it's not just desynchronization, but suppression of synchronization. There's a subtlety, a nuance there, but actually we are now following these ideas. So now we understand that NPS is probably a scale-free natural-like input stimulation that acts as a non-demand only synchronizer. Our main hypothesis right now is that NPS, is, uh, uh, NPS induced natural like activity would compete with aberrant FF form activity for the recruitment of neural circuits. This has major implications um, for the different NPS applications, its efficacy and also its safety. And this, uh, these ideas are um, put out in a recent paper of ours in Epilepsy and Behavior Journal. Anyway, I'm about to finish this presentation, but it's important to mention that we are not the only group seeking for this sort of tempering in the temporal structure of uh, electrical stimulation. There are some very prolific groups such as Frist, uh, Dean Frist and Mark Cook, and also uh, Fernando Santos Valens and David Martinez Vargas group doing with epilepsy. Also uh, Dr. Kinkreth and Path dealing with neural excitability. The, the brilliant work of Peter Tess with including computation simulations, but also animal and human experimentation, dealing with neuroplasticity, uh, uh, the group, uh, the, the brilliant work of Dr. Grill, uh, dealing with motor disorders, and also uh, the, the work of Takashi Kozai. He was a previous uh, a speaker for the Neural Access webinar series, which is doing a very interesting work uh, dealing with the details of tissue response to different temporal patterns of intercortical micro stimulation. So we have to give credit to these guys too, of course. So if you are interested into this topic, please check their, their work out also. Anyway, we have lots of perspectives. We need to improve and expand our results in order to gain more insight and reach more definite conclusions. And we want to do this by improved electrophysiology, uh, by digging, digging into computational models. We are doing this a little bit, but this is too rudimentary by now. Uh, we also want to close the loop in which we uh, have new approaches for detecting brain stating and detecting seizures, maybe even predicting seizures, and new ways of suppressing ictogenesis and epileptogenesis. And with all this in hand, we would incorporate these into intelligent devices that may adjust the neural modulation approach according to the, neural, the, the dominant neurodynamics. This is what I, I, I like to call precision in neuroengineering. Anyway, uh, our next steps are then, uh, in this I'm, I'm clearly copying from a, a previous speaker from Neuronexus. We got some ideas in skill, but we need some more modern tools and more knowledge. And that's why we are approaching uh, Neuronexus for more modern tools. And I, I had the pleasure to know Alexis and Rio in their 2020 Worldwide Symposium for Neurotechnologies. If you could not participate, please uh, check it out because it was simply breathtaking, it was awesome. Uh, and also for, no, for knowledge, uh, we're pursuing a new fellowship abroad. We have been recently granted a, a, a Mahiz Kodovka Kihi Fellowship, Individual Fellowship, and now we've developed this in the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia in Università di Genova under the supervision of Professor Michele Chiapalon. The, the main goal of this, uh, of this project is actually to um, to develop a neuroprothesis for motor rehabilitation and closed group neuroprothesis, but with uh, the, the, the main difference that we want to integrate sleep and sleep wake stages in the loop of lesion branch to benefit it from privilege, uh, uh, from privileged windows of plasticity. This is what we're pursuing. It will start next year. And also to foster the discussion, we've put together this research topic at Frontiers in Neuroscience. So I invite all the community to send their best contributions. So it's open until September, the abstract submission. And this research topic is entitled Engineering Neuromodulation Approaches to Treat Neurolo Neurological Disorder. The, the idea is to put in perspective very well uh, precision neuroengineering approaches to treat neurobiological disorders. If you uh, haven't seen it, you can send me an email and I'll send you the links and everything from within the Frontiers website. You don't need to be invited, explicitly invited to participate, but 
If you want, you just send me an email and I'll send you the links. Uh, so that's all. I thank you again a lot for the opportunity. I thank, thank a lot all my students. They were the, the, the main resource which I could count on for this research and my collaborators in Brazil and in Italy. So this is the city we are, the campus, and also this is the support that I had to perform this research. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I think I extrapolate a little, a few minutes in my time, but not much. I hope you forgive me. Thanks a lot. Um, Dr. Kata, thank you so much for coming. We hope we'll have another webinar like this within another month or so and see everyone back again. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs> thanks a lot. Again, thank Alexis, so thanks a lot, Rio. It was a pleasure.